good to see all of you again and to welcome Barb's friend, Becky. So Barb has extended the invitation to uh, her two of her best friends to join us. And I'm glad to say Becky's here this morning. So uh, from Minneapolis, I presume, St. Paul, either one. Um, so we are in our lesson two of Parables of Jesus. And uh, today's going to be kind of fun. I'm going to do some teaching, but you're going to do a whole lot of the work. So get ready for that. And uh, I think I think we'll learn a lot from each other today. So Jesus knew how wonderful the kingdom of God is, yet he also knew that it was radically different from the world in which people lived then and now. Here we see Jesus using parables to describe this wonderful kingdom and all of its secrets. He wanted people to know and have the kingdom for themselves, so he stole, told these stories in order to attract <clears throat> them to it. But it was nothing like people expected it to be. From this point on in the parables, no explanation is given. Remember I said last week there's, there's differences of opinion as to how many parables there are, ranging between 38 and 46. But only two of them were given a full explanation. The rest of them, it was up, for the, up to the listener to make meaning of the parable for them, to determine the relevance in their own lives. So the setting for today, the setting for the parables we're going to hear today, the first two parables we're going to discuss, the mustard seed and the, and the leaven or the yeast, those took place on the same place as last week, the hillside, where Jesus is in a boat. People have assemble, assembled on the hillside to listen to him. <clears throat> it's a big crowd. He's attracted big, big crowds by this point in time. He's become quite, quite a phenomenon. Um, so the first two uh, parables are to the masses. But then the last four we're going to discuss, three will be about the kingdom of God. The fourth one is more of a, of a charge to the disciples and really a charge to us. Um, they are done just the intimacy of Jesus and his disciples. So uh, a little different, different setting, but still no explanation. So we'll get that for ourselves. So the heading of everything for today is the kingdom of God is like. And so those are the parables many of which you're familiar with. Some of these are really short, like two sentences. Uh, but still, there's a lot to unpack. So I want you, while we're going through the study, to pull out the handout that Robin sent you. Um, uh, she sent it in the email, the big email Saturday, but then she sent a follow-up email reminding you to have it available. And you can use that to take notes, but also we're going to use it as we develop the parables in a little while. So first we're going to start with the parable like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. This parable actually appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Slightly different, not much different. But um, nevertheless, uh, it, was, it was a well-known parable because it was recorded by these three different gospel writers. I'm going to be reading the Mark version, Mark 4, uh, verses 30 through 32 and the, out of the uh, New American Standard Version translation this morning. It says, and he said, and Jesus said, how shall we, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Notice that language, how shall we? You know, Jesus was all about including the people, wanting them to understand, make this for themselves. So um, at the Sermon of the Mount, he was all tell. He was just going through all the aspects of the kingdom of God. But here he's saying, how shall we? And that's my question for you today. How shall we picture the kingdom of God? And then he goes on to say, or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and it becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large, large branches, so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. So when you hear the word mustard, you probably think of the condiment that you put on hot dogs or hamburgers, or Dijon mustard, which is a little fancier that you might put on a sandwich or put in a recipe. But there's a story before those products, and that is the mustard seed itself. For the seed to be useful, the hard coating, outer coating, must fall off. When this happens, the power within the seed is unleashed and roots begin to take shape and reach down into the earth. And that produces another plant. It is one of the smallest seeds, but, there, but when planted can grow up to 12 feet tall 
and can look, look more like a tree than a plant. So tall that as scripture tells us, the birds can nest in its branches. And the seeds themselves are of use. They must be ground up, mixed with water or vinegar before they can be of use. In our story, the original language in Luke suggests that the seed is not a deliberate plant, but something just carelessly thrown, just strewn onto the soil, making its way onto the earth, sprouting seeds and growing. This may have been Jesus's way of addressing the Jews who did not care to hear the truth and tossed it aside. Yet, in spite of their disregard for the kingdom, the seed, the holy seed of God, would still take root and flourish. So, how is it like the kingdom of God? Remember, Jesus was speaking to the Jews who knew the Messiah was coming, but the people misunderstood what this meant. They thought that God would send a king to rescue them from the Roman government and persecution. They expected the savior to set them free using military force, but that was not at all what God had planned. Instead, he sent a savior to free them from their own sin and bondage. Have you ever started something from scratch? At first, it was hard to see anything but the day ahead of you. Hard to vision much of a future. Stories abound about small things that grew exponentially. Perhaps you were once part of a church plant or a small church that grew beyond anyone's wildest imagination or part of a small business that is now highly acclaimed. Or you started a walking program that ultimately ended up in you becoming a marathon runner. Many of us have stood under the teaching of Beth Moore. Do you know her ministry story? Do you know how her Bible studies started? She was an aerobics instructor at First Baptist Church in Houston and then decided to start a Bible study for her students after class. She graduated from college but never attended seminary. She had a heart for Jesus and wanted to know more about him. She attended a Bible college, a Bible doctrine class, and developed a relationship with an older woman at First Baptist Houston named Marge Caldwell, who mentored Beth until the time Marge died. As a young wife and mother, Beth served the Lord by speaking out at luncheons and retreats and volunteering at Mother's Day Out. She eventually taught in a Sunday school class at First Baptist that grew from a few people to over 700 when she stopped doing that. And several of us on this call sat in her classroom every Sunday morning. After years of being encouraged by her students to develop homework and notes, she began to realize that she had a ministry that God had birthed in her life. She published her first book in 1993 in 1994, she founded Living Proof Ministries with the purpose of teaching women to know and love Jesus by understanding the Bible. She offered spring and fall Bible study classes to all the women of Houston on Tuesday nights, and it became the basis for her published studies. Some of you may have attended those as well. I know I did. In fact, she now has a new Houston series on Philippians. She published her first Bible study in 1995, entitled A Woman's Heart, God's Dwelling Place. Since then, she has published 21 Bible studies, sold over 1 million books, including a children's book, journals, including a children's journal, two devotionals. Her studies have been translated into 20 languages and have reached women in countries all around the world. She recently celebrated 20 years of Living Proof Live conferences where over 70,000 women have attended these in 715 locations. She can be seen on television, teaching, Living Proof with Beth Moore on the Trinity Broadcasting Network. And it all started with an aerobics class. In this parable of the mustard seed, Jesus was telling the listeners that their way or assumptions were not God's way at all. Just as Jesus came as a baby, quite surprising for someone who would rescue them and save the world. After Jesus' death and resurrection, a handful of disciples were left to spread the gospel message. They were like that tiny mustard seed, just a speck in the world. 
but like that mustard seed, they were full of hidden power. They had God's Holy Spirit in them. As they traveled and taught, more people believed and the kingdom of God grew. As many as 500 became believers at Pentecost, including Jesus' brother James. Throughout the book of Acts, the numbers steadily grew. And in fact, within one year of Jesus' death, the kingdom had spread all over the Roman Empire in every direction, east to India, south to Ethiopia, and west to Britannia. Today, the kingdom covers the globe, including places like China, Iran, and Afghanistan, and Turkey. Just as the mustard seed produces more seeds for planting, the disciples made more disciples, and they made even more. You are here today because someone discipled to you. Just as the mustard seed plant grows tall and wide, the kingdom of God spreads in every direction, and it continues to grow today. Matthew 24, verses 13 and 14 tell us, staying with it, that's what God requires. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry and you'll be saved. All during this time, the good news, the message of the kingdom will be preached all over the world, a witness staked out in every country. First Colossians, verse six says, all over the world, the good news is bearing fruit and growing. It has been doing that among you since the day you heard it, when you understood God's grace in all its truth. Just as the mustard seed reveals the growth of the church, this parable also describes God's kingdom growth in each and every believer. When a person puts their trust in Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of them, everything changes. Remember at the beginning of this lesson, we learned that the seeds have a hard protective layer that must be crushed before we can use them. That is so like us. If one's heart is hardened, we cannot hear his voice. We cannot hear his words. We do not learn, we do not understand. Hardened hearts do not see the Messiah, do not see who Jesus is, and therefore cannot see the kingdom of God that we thrive in. Our outer shell must be pierced by the word, by the holy words of the Lord Jesus before we can learn and understand him and before the Holy Spirit can indwell us. I invite you to praise the Lord every day for that moment when he pierced your heart and when he broke that shell and allowed him and you allowed him to enter in. Once we learn about this hardness of heart, we can see Jesus' stories taking on new significance. In the case of Jesus restoring sight to the blind, it now became a physical symbol of the spiritual blindness of Israel. In the parables, Jesus is not hiding the truth from the hard-hearted. They just don't have ears to hear. In our study last week about the four soils, we learned about this, that it will be unable to pierce anyone's consciousness if their hearts are hard. And this was the case of the Pharisees, who were Jesus' enemies, who would not let go of their assumptions about the, what the Messiah would be like and how he would lead them, nor could they release their rigid reliance on the law and the power it gave them. At first, as a believer, we may not feel very different, but the Spirit is powerful and it is working. Just as your body grew from infancy, you didn't even think about it. With good nourishment and good health care, you grew into the physical person you are today. Growing up, some of you even had mothers that marked the wall every time you grew a few inches. Likewise, the Holy Spirit has the power to transform a person just as the seed has the power to produce a huge plant. By abiding in him, this spirit, this Holy Spirit produces good things in each of us. The spiritual fruit of Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, but also such things as forgiveness, healing, righteousness, glory, grace, compassion, knowledge, and truth. All of those are products of a heart that has been opened to Jesus. Sometimes the growth is slow, 
But over time, that spirit takes root, sends the roots deep, and as James says, will bring it to its perfect result. Jesus does not deny the greatness and glory that the kingdom will ultimately manifest, but he does want the people to know that it is going to start out very small, almost invisible, but in time, it will grow. So in summary of the mustard seed, there's a hard seed, a hard shell that must be cracked before the mustard plant can grow. Even to use that mustard seed in a recipe, it must be crushed. Likewise, the word must penetrate the heart for the word of God to take root. The mustard seed will start out grow, start out small, and then grow very large with deep roots that will generate future plants and more seeds. Likewise, the kingdom of God will grow as more and more and more people will accept Jesus as Savior and begin to plant seeds in their own lives and share the kingdom of God. So last week you told me you really liked the charts I put together for the parables. So I thought I would do that again this week. I'm not sure about next week yet. We'll just have to see. But for now, pull out your handout and let's look at page one of the handout that was in your email, your attachment. And this is, I use the similar format where I put it in a table. Some of us love tables. We learned that about each other last week. <laughs> and I have columns and lines, and we'll go through this together. Uh, I will tell you what I've harvested from the reading materials and my own understanding of these scriptures and invite you to join me in that. I'm using, again, the Mark 4, verses 30 to 32 translation out of the New American Standard Bible. And he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God, or by what parables shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. So if you look at this table, let's do it together. So we see in the story, we have the mustard seed, and specifically the shell of the mustard seed. And for unbelievers, this is the spiritual, this is the spiritual elaboration, the spiritual explanation of the parable. For unbelievers with hardened hearts, that shell will not be cracked, will not be penetrated. And as a result, they will not hear or see the good news about Christ. They will reject it, not interested, not for me, but for believers. That shell is cracked wide open when our heart is pierced by the Holy Spirit. Everything changes from that moment. The size of the seed, scripture tells us it's the smallest of all. But if your heart is hardened, it's just a seed. I cannot see anything of merit in this seed. It's just a seed. It's no big deal. But as a believer, we know that this small and seemingly invisible and insignificant seed can grow into something phenomenal, life-changing, transformative in our lives, in the church. It starts small but grows oh so big. The productivity of the seed Again, for the non-believer, since the seed shell cannot be pierced, not be penetrated, nothing happens. Roots can't grow. A trunk can't grow. Ultimately, it will, it will die without producing anything. But for believers, once the seed is, the shell is punctured, the seed will grow slow at first. You know that if you're a gardener, your plants start so slow and you wonder if they're going anywhere and then they, the roots take hold and they go crazy. The growth of the gospel in our hearts and in our lives is slow at first, but then will expand with continued exposure to the word and the teachings of Jesus. And we will develop deep roots and a strong, sturdy trunk and branches reaching to heaven and leaves of patience and kindness and joy and love. And more plants will grow and more seeds will be harvested 
and the cycle will continue in our own lives and in the lives of the body of Christ. The field is the world for non-believers. That's all they see. There's nothing beyond what they can see with their eyes and hear with their ears. But for those of us that has chosen to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's the kingdom of heaven. It's this vast world, eternal life, the joy of living in him. The birds, the translators say that for the non-believers, you could interpret that these are, these are evil people, evil things sent by Satan to disrupt the kingdom of God. But for those of us that believe, we know that this means we're abiding with him, that he protects us. He gives us shade. He gives us nourishment. He gives us sunshine. He gives us everything we need if we abide in him in those limbs and the shade. A non-believer cannot benefit from the protection of God. His right hand holding us, keeping us, loving us, protecting us, saving us. For the believer, though, we experience hope and joy and peace, all those wonderful things, and we know the promise of eternal life. Anything you would like to add? That's just my, my take, what I read in the various materials I studied. I know you've studied this passage before. Anything you would want to add? Anything that was new? Kathy? Yes, Helen Rose. You know what I think the birds are? I think the birds represent other people who help us along the journey. Um, it just struck me that it's hard to do this thing alone, but we don't stand alone. Besides God, I think about all of those other people in my life, you know, who nourish this kind of growth. I love that. I love that. I think that's absolutely true. Thanks, Helen Rose. Anyone else? All right. Well, you're going to have time in a minute. Now I'm going to move on to the parable of the yeast. The kingdom of God is like yeast or leaven. Now this is the same thrust as the mustard seed. The kingdom produces significant results out of proportion to very small beginnings. Here, the, the, uh, uh, this parable appears in both Matthew and in Luke. But I'm going to read it out of Luke in the message transliteration. I love this. And uh, if, you want to, uh, if you want to use your paper, your uh, handout, to take notes, there's a page for each of the parables we're going to be studying. And you'll notice this one is blank, and that's intentional because at the end of this, we're going we're gonna to fill it out together. So I love it the way it starts. It's, he tried again. So these are parables, one after another. So he has just told the parable of the mustard seed. And then he goes on, he tried again. How can I picture God's kingdom? The visual language here, how can I picture God's kingdom? It's like yeast that a woman works into dough for three loaves of bread and waits while the dough rises. Now in the Matthew verse, it tells us that the quantity of flour the woman is using is about 50 pounds. Three pecks is about 50 pounds. And yet just a small amount of yeast was enough. And that quantity would have made a dozen loaves of bread for her family. This afternoon, if you wanted to bake bread, if this was motivating you to do some bread baking, and if you wanted to make just two loaves of bread, <clears throat> excuse me, it would call for five and a half to six cups of flour and a packet of yeast equaling about two and a half teaspoons. Not much. In the Matthew verse, it says the yeast was hidden in the flour until all was leavened. That's interesting. This word hidden comes from the Greek word encrypto, from which we get the English word encrypt. The root word means to conceal or to keep secret. 
just as an encrypted message would. Is Jesus really trying to keep this message secret? So what is the difference between leaven and yeast? The terms are used interchangeably. It can be the dry yeast you purchase in the store, or it can be a lump of already leavened dough that you use to make bread. Some of you have made sourdough bread that requires you to retain a small batch of the sourdough and when you make the next batch, you use that as the starter. You use that as the leaven for your new loaf of sourdough bread. That's how they did it in biblical times. Yeast is what makes bread taste good and even smell even better. For those of you who are bakers, you know that when you add a little bit of yeast and sugar and water to flour, there is a chemical reaction called fermentation that produces tiny air bubbles or carbon dioxide all through the yeast. These air pockets make the bread fluffy and light when you bake it. And if you don't add yeast, the bread is flat and firm and tasteless. The leaven or yeast must come in contact for the power to be unleashed. At once, and once the yeast does make contact with the flour, the power is irreversible. You cannot stop the process. You cannot separate the ingredients back to their former state. And you cannot stop the process of this fermentation, which ultimately makes the dough rise until you bake it. This may be why the yeast was described as hidden, because you cannot see it working. You can, however, see the result. Once the gospel truly penetrates the hearts of those whom God has chosen to save, it cannot be stopped and will bring them to salvation and begin the process of becoming more Christ-like. Once he pierces your heart, you are forever changed. It's really interesting to me that Jesus used the example of yeast or leavening in this parable. Because in the Old Testament, leaven, yeast, was a symbol of evil. That's why Helen Rose, in the earlier one, they talked about the birds. There was a, a, some of the commentators really wanted to bring in the notion of evil. I think Jesus is only talking about what's good, what's of him. In the Old Testament, it had to be removed from Jewish homes during Passover. That is what manna is, unleavened bread. It was excluded from sacrifices with the exception of the loaves used at the Feast of Pentecost. In Luke 12, Jesus used the word yeast when he said, Beware the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. We, we see this kind of sp spreading of evil today in social media and news outlets that intend to distort. How a little bit of misinformation, the word now is, goes viral. It goes wild. It's out of control and cannot be stopped. That's a negative a negative example of how something small can permeate. You are going to love this bit of scripture, and I lost the, I lost the address, and I'm sorry. Uh, but here you go. Listen to this. This is a scream. Uh, I think I took this out of the message, I'm guessing. Watch out, Jesus warned them. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. At this point, the disciples began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, You have so little faith. Why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Don't you understand even yet? Don't you remember the 5,000 I fed with five loaves and the baskets of leftovers you picked up? Or the 4,000 I fed with seven loaves and the large baskets of leftovers you picked up? Why can't you understand? I'm not talking about bread. So again, I say, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then at last they understood he wasn't speaking about the yeast and bread, but about the deceptive teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. I love that. And they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. They still were trying to comprehend this thing called parables. Perhaps Jesus, though, was reversing the common evil connotation associated with yeast 
for the purpose of once again prompting the curiosity of the crowd regarding the kingdom of God. Something that formerly would have been considered evil, now he's speaking of it as being good. And you know that would have really enraged the Pharisees. How dare he? Who does he think he is? But then again, it's just a story about a lady baking bread. But without too much effort, we can see sin can be like leaven and spread, if not brought under control, if not tamed by the Holy Spirit. Why did they believe yeast was evil? Mainly because of the process that yeast would go through, the fermentation process. The story of Passover is based on the fact that Pharaoh agreed to let the people go, the Israelites go, after the firstborn was killed. The Israelites, however, were unable to rise their bread in time, so they brought unleavened bread with them when they fled Egypt. That is part of the reason for unleavened, of unleavened bread being part of the Passover feast. Exodus 12, 15 says, For seven days you must, the bread you eat must be made without yeast. On the first day of the festival, remove every trace of yeast from your homes. Anyone who eats bread made with yeast during the seven days of the festival will be cut off from the community of Israel. We see that Jesus here has chosen to use yeast to demonstrate the positive, hidden permeation of the kingdom of God to the world. Once again, he has turned things upside down. Remember, my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. The Jews rightly understood that the arrival of the Messiah would bring change to the world. But his arrival did not bring what they expected. So here, this parable teaches the crowd they must not let the present, small, inconspicuous form of the kingdom fool them from understanding what will be its final result. The kingdom of heaven is indeed active, although not at that time. It wasn't fully observable. It was small. It was difficult to grow. But it all started with the transformation of each and every individual heart. Likewise, the piercing of hearts is not evident to others unless we tell it to others. When the Lord first made himself known to you, and you felt that something was new and going on in your life, it was too soon for probably there to be much demonstration of that. So all of this was happening inside you, just as the yeast and the flour. It was permeating your entire being. The kingdom of God may appear to be invisible, but that does not mean God is not working. He is working quietly and continuously in the background to bring his kingdom to its full result. Eventually it will influence every aspect of society and in the end God will establish his kingdom and eliminate all others. Sometimes we get discouraged when we are trying to live out the kingdom life. Sometimes it feels like no one notices when we're doing the right thing. Sometimes we don't feel like pro producing much fruit. And sometimes it feels like people just don't want to hear the truth about Jesus. Yet our job is to bring this leaven, to bring this knowledge, to bring this heart, heart of ours into contact with humanity. God's job is to save those whom he chooses, but we are the bringers of the good news. These parables should be an encouragement to you. While we might not be able to see big growth in the kingdom every day, rest assured, it is growing in the world and in the hearts of believers. Each and every one of us is more mature in our, in our walk today than we were a week ago or two weeks ago or a year ago. It constantly is permeating every cell of our being. We could not stop the growth of God's kingdom any more than we can take yeast out of a batch of dough or force a mustard plant back into its seed. It's as if Jesus is saying, you Jewish religious leaders may hold to your dead traditions and oppose the truth, but God's living kingdom will still increase and Satan will be defeated. Philippians 1.6 says, for I am confident of this very thing, 
that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Think how remarkable it must have been for the early believers, for this small group of people, to know that by the end of Paul's life, only 40 years after Christ's death, the gospel had been taken to the ends of the known world. So with that, we're going to complete the table about like heaven is like leaven, is like yeast. Again, the scripture verse, he tried again. How can I picture God's kingdom? It's like yeast that a woman works into enough dough for three loaves of bread and waits while the dough rises. Now, imagine yourself. You've just attended this hillside gathering and Jesus has been speaking. And you're walking back home with your friends. You're walking along the shore and eventually making your way to your home or your community. And you're having a conversation about what you've just heard. What do you think that conversation would have entailed? And the, and the elements that are part of this story are the leaven and the yeast and the dough and the woman and the process. I'm going to ask all of you to unmute, and when you respond, I'm just going to ask you to just to quickly state, we're going to take these one box at a time, just quickly state one thing that you think about when you, when you think of the characteristics or the implications. So if you think about the leaven or the yeast that this woman worked into the bread, what would you say, and again, we're going to just stay with the facts, what do we know about yeast or bread? Let's not make any um, assumptions or implications. We're going to do that next. What are the facts that we know about using yeast in a dough? It's a catalyst. It will permeate throughout what is being mixed in. It'll permeate. It's a catalyst. It's an action agent. It makes things happen. What else? It has to be fresh. It has to be fresh. Not stale. Not old. It has an expiration date. What else? It allows it growth. the taste. Growth of the dough. It grow. It helps grow the dough. Grows the dough. What else? Somebody, Lynn, you said something. I couldn't hear you. It improves the taste. It improves the taste. It creates an aroma. An aroma. Uh, a pleasing and um, luring aroma. How many of you are going to go out and bake some bread this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> One other thing I noticed is once it makes contact, it is unstoppable. You can't undo it. What are the implications for the kingdom of heaven? Remember, he said, he tried again. How can I picture God's kingdom? How do you see the kingdom in the leaven or the yeast? This could be implications for the church. It could be implications for individuals, make it clear what you're talking about when you when you offer your suggestion. What are the implications? I see the kingdom more in the dough. That the yeast in the dough makes the dough grow or rise, which would, you know, the kingdom of the church and so on would get bigger. Okay, in the dough. As a and I see it in the dough more than in the yeast. The yeast causes the dough to rise and become bigger. But if you're talking about the world, I would think that the dough, in my impression, the dough would be more the world rather than okay. the yeast. Okay. What about the, back to the leaven or yeast? What are the implications of yeast? And go make that, make that translation to what it means to the life of a believer. <clears throat> Well, the Holy Spirit's involvement in our life is unstoppable. It's we'll unstoppable. Be, we'll be forever transforming us. Barb, your mic is muffled. I'm not sure if there's something in front of it. Um, the, the Holy Spirit's power is unstoppable. That's what I said. What else? <laughs> I want to say something here, but I'm not sure that it's in line with what you what you might hear, but it says here that a woman works into enough dough. Like there is a responsibility here on our part. It just doesn't happen. You just don't throw it in and all of a sudden 
you've got uh, a workable dough. You've got to work with it. And, um, you know, we are believers. Uh, so, so if you think about what leaven might be, what are the things you would want to work into the dough from a spiritual standpoint? What are those things that yeast could be? The word of God. Right. Word of God. Bible study like this. Yeah. Prayer. Prayer. Praise. What else? What are the other implications? What else? How, where else do you see this leaven, this yeast analogy reminding you of the kingdom of God? F fellowship comes to mind mm -hmm. because the yeast grows the body. It grows the dough. So fellowship grow um, with people spreading the word, the yeast growing, spreading the yeast, spreading the word um, grows the kingdom, but you can't do that without fellowshipping with others. So it requires the fellowship, like Chris was saying, it has to be worked into the dough. It has to be worked into the flour. So um, we have to do that through fellowship with others. Absolutely. It's wonderful, Ellie. Anything else? Well, the other thing it says here is we have to wait for it. Well, we knew that we talked about that. It doesn't happen right away. You know, it's a, we have to develop patience in order for it to work within us and within the body of Christ. Um, it's really easy to be impatient. <laughs> uh, well, I put that under, our, under the process, Chris, when we get down to the bottom. The process oh, okay. how this works. All right, what about the dough? Lynn, you've already talked a little bit about the implications in terms of kingdom growth, but what about the characteristics of dough itself? How, how it, dough itself, don't worry about spiritual implications yet. Oh. What do you know about dough itself? It's very pliable and elastic. Okay. What else? It doesn't hold together. Uh, it's just separate grains until um, something liquid um, is brought into the picture. Because without that, it's just these um, grains that can go all over the place. Um, <laughs> like if you've ever spilt flour or uh, dropped something in flour, not expecting, and then it just goes poof, it just can, it can fly through the air without, um, uh, doing its job so it's it's grainy that's what I'm trying to say yeah. grainy and and a little more on that Ellie you know you take the four ingredients is flour yeast water and sugar they're all four separate ingredients but the minute you mix it together it is one it is one clump of dough and then the yeast does its work within that well and you're really you're talking about the the dough and I was referring to flour but you're right sorry that that's kind of a separate it's okay I should have put flour I didn't put flour it's it's an ingredient and it goes it can go all over the place what about what are the, the spiritual implications of dough Lynn talked about it being kingdom growth it's it, it could be a metaphor for kingdom growth what else do you see um, it can be dough, used for so many things it's versatile dough has to rest and so I see that as a meditation on scripture, things like that, trusting the Lord, patience, you know, but it has to rest before it actually becomes, before you can bake it. That's right. You have to put it in a warm place and let it rise. And sometimes there's a second rising, right? What else? There's a big one. It's kind of what uh, we look at. The ingredients have to work together work to together. form the dough. And I think about the fact that the ingredients in the dough have to be fresh. I mean, if you use stale flour or flour that has weevils in it, mm -hmm. you won't get the same result. And to me, that kind of means that, you know, we have to keep our hearts um, fresh and open in order for the yeast to work. Absolutely. What about the woman? What, what do we know about this woman? What does she do? We've already alluded to some of this. 
she took and hid in three measures of flour. So she took the ingredients and began mixing them together. Okay. What else? She would have had to be working the dough, kneading the dough to work the ingredients together. Yeah, you don't just, you know, bread, if you haven't made bread, it's unlike making a cake. You don't just put stuff in a bowl and stir it. It, it requires that manual working and flipping and pushing and kneading. Very different than baking other things. What else? Somebody said waits. We talked about waiting. She patiently says she waits while the dough rises. You know, I, for the first time I'm seeing, it doesn't say it specifically, but she measured. It says she hid in three measures. So she had to measure the flour, measure the ingredients. So she's, she's wise and discerning about what ingredients go together to make this dough. She knows the recipe. That's it. Good. She knows, she knows what's required. Okay. What about the spiritual implications of the woman? This is a She's hard. willing. She's willing. What else? She's patient. She's patient. It takes work. It doesn't just happen. You've got to start a work at it. She's dutiful. She's dutiful. Spiritually, to me, it was like it allows God to work in one's life, bringing all aspects of who we are together. Our past, our present, hope for our future. What about the process? What do we know about the process of making bread? Again, some of this we've already said. Well, it doesn't happen quickly. It takes time. It takes time. Yes. If you're going to bake bread this afternoon, you better start now. If you want it yeah. for dinner. If you want it, it takes for dinner. skill. It takes skill. It seems like, you know, these pastry chefs that I read about are really in high demand. And sometimes you'll, you'll see on a menu uh, at, a, at a fine restaurant, they'll, they'll list the name of the chef, the head chef, but they'll also list the pastry chef <laughs> because it's, it's such a learned skill. Absolutely. What else? All right, what about spiritual implications of the process? What about this is similar to the process of um, growing in your faith or becoming a member of the kingdom of God? What else? To realize we start out small. Start small. Many times. And it takes patience, which patience. I don't have a lot of. What else? It's work. It's work. It's investment in study, reading the Bible, praying. All those aspects of, of deepening our roots, of knowing more about him. I was thinking too about when you make bread, you have to punch it down. Yep. Um, uh, and then you have to knead it again. And then sometimes you have to punch it down a second time after yep. you let it rise again. And so I think that there are these you know, deflating moments in our spiritual life that we have to recognize that are part of the growth. Yep. So these, this, de the deflation or the punching down of the dough, um, it, it can happen in our spiritual life where we have setbacks or we have uh, times of where we're deflated. We feel like nothing's happening, but God can praise us again. I love that, Ellie. I, I love that. You know, and when you punch it down, the chemical process kind of starts all over again. And you, you get that second rise. So I'm going to do a little teaching and then I'm going to let you, I'm going to teach quickly through the next three parables. And then, so put yourselves back on mute and then we're going to take some time towards the end and maybe do a little work on your own in small groups. So the next three parables are under the heading, what the kingdom is worth. It gets into the value of the kingdom. And again, 
this is where we start with Jesus is only speaking to the disciples. And they are having their own conversation about the story, but what is the meaning of the story? The first one uh, is Matthew 13, 44. It says, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden. Other translations, yours might say buried in a field. It's intentional, not accidental. You know, treasure just didn't happen to be there. Somebody buried it. It was hidden. It was in a field for years and then accidentally found by a trespasser, a man, someone, or so other translations might say. The finder is ecstatic. What a find. Other translations say he even buried it again. He covered it up. So the man is ecstatic. He what a find he proceeds to sell everything he owns to raise the money to buy that field. This parable emphasizes that the kingdom has value that far outweighs what anyone looking on an open field might have suggested. How valuable is this kingdom that Jesus is talking about? It is so valuable that this man is willing to sell everything he owns in order to purchase the field not just the treasure, the entire field, the entirety of what God has for us. Who is the man? The Greek word used here is emparas, which means a merchant man on a journey traveling for his trade. In the message, he's called a trespasser, making it perfectly clear that this is not his land. Finding the treasure was a surprise. It was accidental. He just happened upon it. He wasn't searching. In those days, treasures were often hidden in fields because there was no formal place to do so. No banks, no safety deposit boxes, no vaults, no home safes. Sometimes we hear about parents and grandparents hiding stuff under the mattress. But in those days, there was nowhere to hide it, so they would hide it in the field. They did this often when a marauding army was approaching. And if the homeowner did not survive the invasion, the treasure would sit there, would be forgotten, and lay there until someone else claimed it. The land could change hands several times without anyone being aware of that treasure being there. We read stories about artwork found or jewels found years after it was put in storage or, or hidden. So we see here the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure that goes unnoticed because of its hidden nature. The man knew the treasure was valuable. He happens upon it and instantly recognizes its worth. He was full of joy, so much so that he rehid it so that no one else could find it. He went home and sold everything he owned, his house, his furniture, his jewelry, his sheep, his goats, the treasure was so important to him that he joyfully gave up everything else in the world to gain that treasure. He bought the whole field, not just the treasure. He wanted all of it. Nor did he simply take the treasure. He wanted to purchase it legally. He could have covered it up, gone about his business and forgotten about it, but that's not what he did. The treasure was too great to forget about. He probably laid awake at night thinking about it after his discovery. Will someone else find it before I sell my stuff and get back there? Did I cover my tracks? When we discover that we can enter God's kingdom, we have a choice to make, just as the man did. We can see the treasure, and we can go back to our old way of life, or we can see God's kingdom full of peace and love, forgiveness, freedom, joy, grace and want that more than anything else. And we can't stop thinking about it. Jesus is not saying you must go out and sell everything you have. He is saying you should be willing to. He is saying that nothing compares in value to the new life that the king has for you and that you should not love anything or anyone more than you love the king himself. That is the greatest treasure, and it is available to all who trust him. The next parable is the parable of heaven, like a costly pearl. Again, these are coming one after another. Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46, he says, or, remember again, these are one after the other. So we've just heard about the hidden treasure, 
Or God's kingdom is like a jewel merchant on the hunt for exquisite pearls. Finding one that is flawless, he immediately sells everything and buys it. Great similarity, but some difference. The description of the pearl here in the King James Version, which is the first English translation of the Bible from the original Greek or Hebrew. The, Greek, the word here in the King James is goodly. And the meaning of that is what you would think, beautiful, handsome, excellent, eminent, choice, surpassing. But it also means purity of heart and life, morally good. So the description of this is this is a pearl that is morally good. Now, pearls in and of themselves aren't anything. They're just a thing. But when we apply it to the kingdom of God, it is saying a pearl is a gem, but it is pure. It is pure of life, it is pure of heart, and it is morally good. The other difference here is in this case, rather than unexpectedly stumbling across a hidden treasure, we find a merchant who is out deliberately searching for precious gems for his inventory. Apparently, he's in whole, a wholesale pearl dealer on a professional trip looking for pearls for his business. This man was well qualified to recognize value and he knew its worth. And like the man in the field, he knew that the total value of what he had paled in comparison to the value of that precious pearl. Pearls were highly prized in Jesus' day. It would have been a good example to use. But a pearl of yellow tinge or one that was rough or not round quickly sank in value. This merchant had spotted a, a rare pearl that was round, smooth, perfectly white, and of unique value. Like a well-trained expert, one discovering the kingdom of God will learn that nothing is comparable in worth. Whatever cost a person expends is nothing in comparison to the benefit of belonging to the kingdom of God. Salvation and righteousness are a greater treasure than anything the world has to offer and the source of far greater joy. And when we recognize this, we know that all the sacrifice we make cannot compare to the joy of experiencing Christ as our Lord and Savior. There were some things that you had to give up when you became a believer. And it might have been hard at first, but as you look back, it was nothing at all. Why a pearl? I thought it'd be important to do a little research on pearls. I thought I knew a little bit about pearls, but that I needed to know a little bit more. So how are pearls made? And I looked at a place called the Pearl Source. Well, we know pearls come from oysters and mussels. The process begins when a particle, sand, or what is referred to as an irritant, gets inside the mollusk. This particle, in essence, functions as the nucleus of the pearl from a very early stage. Once the irritant becomes trapped, the mollusk begins to coat it with something called nacre, or mother of pearl, as a defense mechanism to protect it. Nacre is, is a composite made mostly of aragonite that is strong and iridescent. The unique luster or glow of pearls comes from this nacre. The mollusk coats the nucleus with thousands upon thousands of layers of nacre, and over time, the pearl slowly begins to form. Now, no one can see the making of a pearl for it is hidden in the shell of the oyster under the waters. How long does it take a pearl to form is dependent on the growth rate of the nacre. Most pearls typically take anywhere from two to four years to fully develop. What a perfect metaphor for our faith. Let me translate that for you. Oftentimes our walk with God starts with a crisis in our life, an irritant, something we didn't expect, something that causes difficulty, pain, sorrow for us. When life spins out of control, when things seem hopeless, when everything changes for us and not for the better and our pain and suffering become too much to bear. When that happens and we recognize our need for Christ, we accept him as Lord and Savior. We start our intentional walk with him. Maybe we attend church for the first time in 
years. We start a Bible study. We start attending. We sit in the back of the room. We're not too sure about this stuff. Maybe our, our prayer life increases. Maybe we do some journaling. Maybe we start developing Christian friends or hobbies and interests. And like the pearl, we put on layer after layer after layer of Jesus. At first, others might not recognize this change in us, but over time, they will. We become deeply rooted in Christ and formed into a thing of beauty. The initial flaw, the crisis, the irritant is not gone. It is the very core of who we are and very much a part of us. But the Lord will use that for the rest of your life in ministry, in your story, because we are covered in grace, because he loves us as his children. We cherish who we have become in him, even with the irritant. He becomes the most important and valuable thing in our life, worth far more than anything else. We are a thing of beauty and great value for others to behold as we live for him and seek ways to love and serve him, making disciples of others. Unlike the merchant, we as believers have nothing to offer and the treasure is not for sale. Jesus has already paid the price of our pearl. And upon discovery of this treasure, and life with him, we want to freely share it with others rather than hide it. And the kingdom of God continues to yield an unlimited supply of treasure each and every day, from now until eternity. That is the parable of the pearl. The final parable I'm going to teach you is about like a fishing net or a dragnet, some of the translations say. I'm going to read this out of the message translation. It's Matthew 13, verses 47 through 50. Or, or so he's offered the, the treasure, the buried treasure, now he's offered the pearl. Or, God's kingdom is like a fish net cast into the sea, catching all kinds of fish. When it is full, it is hauled onto the beach. The good fish are picked out and put in a tub. Those unfit to eat are thrown away. That's how it will be when the curtain comes down on history. The angels will come and they'll cull the bad fish and throw them in the garbage. There will be a lot of desperate complaining, but it won't do any good. Like the wheat and the tares, this parable focuses on the consequences of the choices we make in our lives. The net here is something called a seine or a dragnet, the oldest type of net used on the lake, and until recently the most popular fishing method available. It was shaped like a long wall, 25 feet high at its center and five feet high on each of the ends. And it can be dragged through a body of water trapping fish inside. You can picture that, can't you? Because it was so large and when filled, it was too heavy to put on the boat, so it had to be dragged to shore. And when they pulled it in, it contained an assortment of fish that had to be sorted. Separating good fish from bad fish was an ancient tradition in Israel. Remember, the first four disciples were fishermen. Among those considered bad fish were those without fins and scales, which were considered unclean according to Jewish law. The bad fish were thrown back into the sea, but the good fish were gathered up by the fishermen and put in containers. The preaching of the gospel in the world does not convert the world, but it is like a huge dragnet that gathers all kinds of fish, some good and some bad. And in a similar way, the world of the believers of the world and the non-believers will be sorted at judgment day. In the meantime, just like the wheat and the tares, the fish will live side by side every day side by side. Now, when we did this live, we broke the group into small groups on Zoom. But for you, please take the attachment at this time and complete it with the three parables I just taught. The parable of great treasure, 
the one of the pearl of great price and the fishnet. Take some time to go back through the parables, go back through the notes you took, what you learned and when you understood, and jot those down on the form and the attachment that was provided with this video. Pause the video now, and then you can resume once you've completed that. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up with our final parable, which is it is not under the heading of the kingdom, kingdom of God is like, it is different. I call it, do you understand it? Um, Matthew 13, verses 51 and 52. Jesus has just spent time. He's given the, the disciple, he's given the people four parables that we studied last week and this week. And now he's given um, uh, three more parables just to the disciples. And his question to them is brilliant. He said, Jesus asked, the message says, are you starting to get a handle on this? I have a blank notes page for you with the two translations I'm going to pull from. Are you starting to get a handle on this? And you may be thinking to yourself, I think I'm beginning to get a handle on this. In the uh, New Living Translation, he just says, do you understand all these things? And notice that the response of the disciples is yes. Remember, mm. After he told them the parable about the four soils, they said, Jesus, what in the world does this mean? But now they're beginning to understand this way of communicating in parables, where what he says really has this altogether different meaning. And then it goes on to say, he goes on to say, then you see how every student well-trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store who can put his hands on anything you need, old or new, exactly when you need it or is like a homeowner who brings from his storeroom new gems of truth, new and old. So he's saying, when you teach someone, you are filling them. You are filling them with information. You are filling them with scripture. You are filling them with wisdom, God's wisdom, so that they can distribute it to those who need it when they need it. Now he's doing this in part. He's, he's telling them what their role will be in part to differentiate his teaching from that of the Pharisees. Remember, the Pharisees were Torah trained. They, were, they knew the Jewish law inside and out. And they studied under great, they spent their whole life studying under great rabbis, um, passing on traditions and all the things in the law and the prophets from the Old Testament. But the difference was the Pharisees and the scribes, they stood in a place of superiority over everyone else and held themselves apart. They lived hypocritical lives. But the scribe for the kingdom of God, the teacher of the, of the words of the kingdom of God, will bring forth from his heart all that he has learned, all the understanding that God has given him. And they are to faithfully pass it on to others, just as they have been taught. This marks an important development in the training of the disciples and their future role through the ages. Jesus has now equipped them. He's told them some of his methods for communication, and they are saying, yes, Lord, we understand. Notice in here there's specific mention of the old and the new. The New Testament is not, not meant to replace the Old Testament. It fulfills the Old Testament. And so all this knowledge, this knowledge from Judaism that all of these early believers had, they were, it, all the, the prophecy in the Old Testament, all the words of, of the prophets and of the, the uh, patriarchs is now coming to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And that is why this is different. The word here for new is kinos, meaning unprecedented, novel, uncommon, unheard of, different, not new in time. The message itself is radically different. It doesn't take the place of, it doesn't say it's not important anymore, it builds on it, but it's radically new. You have to change your way of thinking. We too must draw on the truths of both the Old and the New Testament. It is not enough just to know the New Testament, but we must know the Old, we must know the basis, we must know about God's faithfulness as he led his people through the, to the Promised Land, through times of exile, through times of difficulty. The, the di disciples needed to be able to connect the two, to tell the full story of Jesus. They were to pull from the storerooms of their heart, both the old and the new. They were to share everything they had learned. 
we too are responsible to do the same thing. If you're sitting here just to consume all this information and do nothing with it, you're not going to be of great value to the kingdom. It's about taking all of this and internalizing, just as the pearl, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, and having a story, having a ministry, having a mission to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm.